what's most important for us? That is not the question. Science does not ask what is most important to the five random people that happen to be in the room when this brainstorming took place. There are some scientific facts about certain impacts and their scale and scope, looking at biodiversity, carbon emissions, but also many societal impacts. Innovations in Sustainable Finance, a University of St. Gallen podcast by Julian Kölbel. Hello and welcome to another episode of Innovations in Sustainable Finance. I'm Julian Kölbel, Assistant Professor of Sustainable Finance at the University of St. Gallen. Now, in this podcast, I strive to talk about innovations. And today, I think we have a really innovative topic. I'm very happy to have with me on the show Anu Nieminen of Upright, the CEO of Upright, I should say, a very exciting tech startup that has set out to build an automated way to quantify companies' net impact on people, planet, society, and knowledge. Wow, quite an ambitious project there. And Anu, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Perhaps to start us off, can you give us the elevator pitch of what Upright is doing? Upright has built, a, I would say, fairly unforeseen data model that aims to build a bridge between the global corpus of scientific knowledge and the real world impacts of companies and especially the company's core business, what they actually do. And in practice, it means that we utilize different types of machine learning technologies, or to be a bit more specific, different types of natural language processing technologies to summarize the findings that humanity has created on all sorts of phenomena related to activities in the, in the modern capitalistic system. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we also collect information on what companies actually do. We're not so much interested in perhaps their reports on corporate behavior or whether they have been naughty or nice in their own words, but the actual nerdy substance. So what is their product? How is it produced? What are the raw ingredients? What are the use cases? Who are the customers? And we do this in a big data approach. So instead of doing that in a sort of analyst type of report by report fashion, we are doing that at scale. And it means that we are very crude and very inaccurate at first, and then we slowly get to better accuracy. And then the upside is obviously getting to a large scope and thus reaching comparability. That is very important for us in this mission. Wow. Thank you. I really look forward to, to dig into that. And as I said, it's great to have you here to do it right here with you on the podcast. Maybe to begin with, could you help us think who might use the data and what would they do with it? I imagine there's there's a range of use cases, but maybe you can pick some examples. Sure. So the mission is to, and this is now very broad, but I'm going to be honest. So I'm, I try not to be afraid of also sounding, sounding uh, as ambitious as we really are. So the mission is really to equip all the stakeholders of companies with better common sense data on how companies actually impact the world around us. Stakeholders simply meaning whether it's investors who are financing companies, whether it's customers who are buying products for companies uh, in B2B, it's other companies in B2C, it's consumers, whether it's people who decide where they work, that is employees, talents, students all over the world, or whether it's public sector agents that are doing regulation or writing laws and so on. But in more practice, who today uses the data? So currently we work with roughly 200 organizations, roughly half of them are institution investors and the other half are corporates. And from the institution investors, we work with the likes of both uh, pension funds, like some of the largest in Europe, APG, PGGM. We work with private equity players like EQT, Premira, banks such as Nordea, also some interesting institutions like European Investment Fund, European Investment Bank. And what we help them to do is typically either measure their impact at scale through a portfolio that can be very, very wide and otherwise impossible to reach comparability if you don't have a big data approach like ours. Or then for the private equity side and the asset management side, we also typically help them to build new products. So let's say they want to comply with SFDR Article 9. They're wondering how to actually do this in a way that they don't <laughs> end up either 
restricting the investment universe unnecessarily or end up looking silly and doing something based on a very spotty data. So yeah, that, that, is, that is the use case for the institution investor side. And for corporates, we help them do two things. So one, one thing is to have like an outside in something that is not coming from them themselves or their, or their communications consultants, like an outside in broad, nerdy, uh, science-based view of what is actually the value that they create. That's our net impact quantification. And for the other very, very tangible use case, we help them handle their CSRD mandated double material assessment for which we have we have found out that our impact engine is actually pretty savvy for since it has been building hundreds of, of different impacts into it during the past seven years. Thank you. Now, the idea of scoring companies along their their impact has been around, but the innovation in Bright's case seems to be in the in the method of how that is being done. So I would really be happy if you could walk us in broad strokes through the method. How does upright how does the upright model come up with company specific profiles? What's the secret sauce? For me, this all started with just being obsessed with a problem that seemed I was I was not happy with hearing all the people that were wiser and more experienced than me. I, I started to ask them already in high school, then during my university studies, then during my days in early stages of of learning how to act in the corporate world, that this is a problem that just cannot be solved. And I felt that I have this motto of compromise the answer, not the question. I found that especially in technology, we tend to sometimes find great tools. And then we end up answering something that might, in the end of the day, be of very secondary value, but we might get very accurate answers. And also, I think the world of ESG and sustainable finance is sometimes a little bit guilty of finding the things that are easy to measure. If you look at the sustainability reports of many, many great funds and, and companies as well. Anyways, I started with the question that what kind of value do companies really create? And I was rather ready to compromise the initial accuracy of the result than the question itself. And what the upright model does, if I try to give you a, a very brief and broad idea of the architecture, the main idea is to look at all the different ways in which companies impact the world around us, aim to somehow first understand the scope, uh, and sorry, the scale of that impact, whether it's via monetization, and we will probably touch upon that later, or via another unit of measure <laughs> that is available to us, and then allocate that 100% of that impact across the whole private sector. Let's take a simple example, or probably the most easier to understand is carbon emissions. So we take the global CO2 emissions estimated by the IPCC and a couple of other global institutions that are estimated to be caused by the, the private sector globally, and we aim to allocate them across all the companies in the world today. And how do we get there? So the first step is what we started building seven years ago. We need to somehow understand what do we mean with the private sector. We weren't happy with the list of companies, like let's take an index or something. We needed something more granular and something that would be holistic. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand all the products and the services that can be traded in the global markets. So what does the global GDP consist of? So we need to somehow understand all the products and the services. And long story short, we started with a couple of different global frameworks used by the Eurostat in the customs data that was available in the EU area and so on. But uh, long story short, we ended up broadening it quite a bit. So the most accurate sort of mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive structure we could find was only a couple of hundred or uh, roughly 1000 lines broad. It is seriously not, not accurate enough to even start to model impact. We have now built our own product graph consisting of 150,000 service and product categories. So that's the beginning. We need to understand what does the global private sector consist of? And now we have built this knowledge graph in not just the list of the products, but it is their interrelations in value chains. So understanding, let's say if I'm looking at a product that needs to be an accurate enough level, it can be just car or soda, but it needs to be like a aspartan sweetened soda packaged in a recyclable aluminum can. So that product would then be linked to the aspartam, to the aluminum colorings, whatever go into the product. And in downstream, it would be linked to who, what is the next step of the value chain, whether it's a wholesaler of uh, sodas and so on and so on. We also have the market size information and other relevant information for each of these nodes. 
Then we map this graph against the world's largest open access database of scientific publications called the CORE, put together initially by Oxford scientists. And we ask this database, what do you know about the impact, let me put a footnote on that, of each and every one of these 150,000 products. And for that, we have, of course, needed to then define what are impacts. So what are all the ways that companies can impact the world around them? And we have built what I could call an impact grid. We take one of those categories, let's say physical diseases. We ask the database using these natural language processing technologies and much of the developments of the large language model space. We ask them, what do you know of the impact of, let's take one particular disease, a certain type of cancer, and let's take one ingredient in the value chain, the aspartam. And we do this as many times as there are combinations between the impact terms and the products in the graph. That's how we end up with net impact profiles for 150,000 products. And the next step, step is fairly simple. We just map these to real life companies. It's actually a whole other technological debacle, but I won't go there because it's maybe the more straightforward step still to understand. So we simply ask, what are the products and the services that McDonald's's revenue consists of? We then map McDonald's uh, weighing with the revenue contributions to the product graph. And then the next step towards funds, portfolios, company groups is fairly straightforward from, from there. Wow. Thank you very much. I'm having two thoughts. The one is that I want to quickly just highlight. It's something that you said is that you were, you would rather compromise on the answer and not on the question. I think that's a really interesting premise. And I agree that this is sometimes an issue that people prefer to go for a number that can be accurately measured, but it doesn't really answer the question. And I agree with you. The question is, what is the impact and, and how can the impact be improved? So I don't know if you want to, I just want to emphasize that. I think that's a great premise. And I think we will see that, you know, accuracy is going to be the the front on which you, you know, on, on which you'll have challenges is obvious. It's, it's so ambitious that you, you wouldn't, you won't get it right all the time. But, but I, I applaud you taking on the challenge. I agree. You're going after the big one. I think in the sort of status where we are with corporate sustainability at the moment, I think there is a real risk. And even though I'm an eternal optimist, otherwise I couldn't be doing what I'm doing. This is mind boggling. This is impossible. This hurts my head. I'm going to be wrong all the time. I couldn't be doing this if I wasn't an optimist. But one thing that I, I am a little bit worried about is the sort of we are it reminds me of some of the wise history, some story, wise stories from, from the history where people have been a little bit burying their heads in the bushes. And at the same time as there are some existential threats, we're not even interested about the scale of the largest impacts, but we would rather get the, the sort of scale of order impact 17 exactly right. One example could be in scope one, two and three emissions. We are interested in, in tinkering around, we're, we're using huge amounts of human resources of tinkering the scope one right, when it doesn't even move the needle uh, very often for, for a majority of, of businesses that are, are being looked at. So what I try to sort of accelerate with this project and what we try to do is to show that we need to first understand what is big and what is not. We need to be brave enough to tackle things that are the most important ones, even if we don't get the accuracy that makes us feel safe. And this is especially it's very understandable. This is especially difficult in finance, where accuracy is everything. I mean, you lose your job if you're not accurate in finance. And we simply need to understand that the phenomenon we are facing with corporate sustainability, or whatever you want to call all of this, the, the transition of the capitalistic system, is so vast that it is completely different from calculating the dollars in, in a balance sheet. This is, this is something different. No one even knows what balance is, what sheet is, what is revenue, what is profit. We're even starting to understand these things. And I think this humility is needed for all of us to say that we don't know the first decimal. We don't even know where the point should be in the number. So this is something that we try to facilitate with the process. And if it requires some of us making, making ourselves look like we're tackling something huge with total inaccuracy, I'm happy to be that person and, and try to contribute in the discussion by that way. The second thing I that struck me is that the part you describe that you ask a database of vast body of scientific knowledge what it knows about aluminum say or aspartam that's something really exciting because 
scientists, as I know them, they would usually focus on something very, very specific and be very, very careful in how they figure that out. And it's actually very, very difficult to take the body of knowledge and come up with a sensible estimate for the real world in some real case that is perhaps not the, exactly the one that has been studied, but you know, if, you know, look at papers around that and, and interpreting all that. So I hope, or I think that's, you know, that's a question how, how well that works. I know it from personal experience that it's, it's hard to do. It would be so exciting, you know, if language models would, would, will, will get this right. Is that something that's being tried in other contexts as well? That sort of, you know, question answer game between a body of knowledge and an algorithm? So can you rely on, on an active stream of research that's trying to do that in general and you apply it in your context? Absolutely not. It is not our job to just, I mean, we don't just ask a large language model to basically, hey, scale this impact and tell us what it is. So the work that is being required to structure something like this is immense. So the use cases where we then do apply the large language models are fairly straightforward. They need to be extremely well structured and you cannot skip the human work in this, at least not with today's technology and not with the, uh, we've been using the first version of ever since Google came up with their first version of BERT, the language model. We took it in 2018, sorry, and started to build the first version of the upright model based on that. So way before large language models were cool. And the whole idea how to work with these tools is you have to have a very like exceptionally good structure and structuring and you need to be willing to do the work very deep so when i say that we ask the scientific body of knowledge it doesn't just mean that we apply some off the shelf tool and then hey it told us that the impact is 4.7 so the first thing to understand is that the scale the monetization of each of the impacts is something it, it requires a lot of mathematics on our side so we are not asking any large language model to scope the impacts. They are not, at least today, they are not ready to do that. So the whole scoping and giving, first of all, the playing ground, what is the amount of the impact we are now being allocating here is something that requires a lot of data science on our end and is not something that we can, we can just throw to the LLMs. So the question needs to be extremely well structured. And that's something if what I think about, what I'm proud of our team, uh, obviously we have an immense, immense challenge where it's just getting started. There are so many things we're doing imperfectly. But one thing where we have actually been fairly good is combining the work of humans and, and the work of computers and being sort of willing to do the work. As an example, when we got started, training data for anything like this did not exist. So what we did, we hand labeled first more than 33,000 scientific publications for causal relations found in their abstract between product and impact labels. And this was something that could not be outsourced with any kind of mechanical Turk or just, hey, students come in and do this. You need at least like a deep understanding of the problem and at least some kind of sort of knowledge of scientific language and the different conventions that it uses for us to be able to then teach this to, to a machine. So this requires sort of a lot of work on, on our behalf. We first of all, start to like, what is the impact of causing or preventing physical diseases according to the World Health Organizations? What are all the diseases? All of this work is something that comes from us. And then when we get to the level of this is an impact term, this is a product term. Then we can turn to an LLM to ask, what can you find between th these two particular terms in this body of 300 million scientific publications? Thank you. I can tell by, you're, you are clearly doing a very good job of packaging something that is a lot of work and, and rather complex in, into simple words. So thank you very much for that. Let's turn to something more concrete. Can you just give us two examples? One company that, according to Upright's methodology, has, has a highly positive impact and, and one that has a negative impact. And how, how does that look like? And, and maybe that's just also to point out, there is a very nice free version of the database online. So you can go and, and check out your favorite company and see how it does. Um, but over to you, Anu. Maybe just to give you two very concrete examples. So obviously you would find the tobacco companies and the, and the obvious examples, but maybe something to explain a little bit better what we, what we, how we contribute to the discussion on ESG and, and, and sustainability today. So an example of a company that might not be 
celebrated for its impact. It not, might not be winning all the ESG awards out there. It might not be on the cover of FT for <laughs> various sustainability related wins would be, for example, condoms. So a physical product requires physical production, but in any way where you would be evaluating in a quantitative manner, the environmental cost of producing a condom, and then on the plus side, the health impact of using a condom, that would be a clear net positive operation. Something that that's not talked about, but very, very common sense. Another example would be building some very unsexy infrastructure like sewage systems, something we take for granted, something we don't celebrate in ESG ways in any way. I We don't hear many students maybe being like, yeah, I'm going to do something positive and impact and join this amazing sewage infrastructure company. But its impact on and, and how it sort of rationalizes the use of the natural sort of resources that are needed to build this concrete, tangible system underground has a huge positive impact. And health-wise, it's, it's a very no-brainer. On the other hand, some companies... Hang on, might- hang on. This is so interesting. I completely agree with you that condom producing companies will not end up on the FT cover for being ESG champions. But as you say it, it makes perfect sense. Thanks for bringing that up. That's a real, that's a real insight. And, and the same thing with this, same thing with the sewage. Okay. But then go on. What are, what are the, what are perhaps, do you have bad sort of, you know, these were kind of the ESG, the hidden ESG champions. Do you have hidden ESG problem childs as well? Yes, yes. And I sometimes say when people ask me that, are you out there? What's the personal mission? Are you out there to kind of like erase the bad companies? And no, actually, if I could take away, if I would hold in one hand the bad things that companies are doing, whatever that means for each of us. And on the other hand, the things where humanity is using resources in a very unproductive way, I would definitely take away the latter, not the former. And I'm going to give you one example. Let's take an application that a really cool company out of Silicon Valley. They are, are employing 200 of the brightest minds in machine learning straight out of school from Stanford and, and MIT and whatnot, employing a lot of the brightest minds of today. And they are doing, let's say, ad tech optimization for tobacco companies, airlines, and fast fashion. That would be a company that would look like, hey, it's tech. It's, it's not bad. It doesn't have a factory. It doesn't have emissions. They hardly have any emissions and, oh, they compensate for all of their flights. But would, if you take a purely scientific look at what are the resources being used, what are the opportunity costs of those, also of the human capital employed, and what is the actual impact being, let's say, slight increase in sales of tobacco, fast fashion and flights or something like that, that could very well end up being a net negative operation. So I'd like to highlight that many of the modern sort of technology companies don't automatically get out of jail just because they don't have factories and just because they are digital companies. And this is something that I think the global sustainability discussion is only starting to realize. I've noticed that too, that the consumption of human capital features largely in in your model so so the logic as i grasp is then if you if you have a company that uses a lot of human resources just in, you know in terms of their mental capacity then uh, that's an opportunity cost so it, it depends they could be doing something else and and your point is or or the point of your your model is that you know basically you have to benchmark your own labor to to what else you might be doing is is that is that correct this is definitely the most debated impact i think i have probably made many 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 of my team members hate me because of my stubbornness with this impact but this is this is a serious point that i want to make and this is one that i don't think without it we will get much further in the whole global discussion around sustainability so we need to understand and this is not just saying that oh, well let me get get further to to the different the trade-offs between the different impact categories. So the upright model wants to look at all of the different resources that are not infinite <laughs> for, for yeah. the capitalistic system as equal resources, whether it's it's capital, whether it's, um, or capital is not necessarily the great, greatest example, but whether it's natural resources, whether it's human brain power. And this is a reason why we introduced a highly controversial impact category called scarce human capital to the model early on. 
it, it just simply says that if you are, let's say, let's look at two companies. One of them is employing 100 people who are homeless on the streets of San Francisco. And the other one is employing 100 people like the ones I just mentioned straight out of Stanford or MIT or whatever. The second company would need to get more done on the plus side, like in order to sort of reach the same ratio, just in order to use the resources as, as efficiently, because the opportunity cost and the sort of counterfactual scenario for the two groups of people is completely different. And I think this is also something where we like to a little bit tease around the idea that we are facing some existential problems. Can we really afford to have so many people and such a high percentage of the best brains alive today solving problems that are of secondary or even below that importance or even oftentimes contributing to these problems instead of solving them. I see how that can start discussions, but I don't disagree with it. It's very interesting, especially when you you brought up the capitalistic system a number of times, right? So so you if you if you come from a market's logic, you might argue, well, that startup in silicon valley that does ad tech it has investors backing it uh so so people see a value in whatever the company is doing or there's a market value in in that and and that's the question whether the market gives the right signals on what you know what people should be doing you, you could argue you should just do whatever gives you the highest salary right that's the right thing to do and in you know, if, if you believe in, in markets allocating resources, that, that should work out. But I appreciate that the upright model gives an alternative view of that. And I think that's perfectly legitimate. I'm, I'm not saying one of the two is, is necessarily right, uh, but it's interesting to have an alternative view of that and then, and then start a discussion, whether that's truly the right job you should take or, or whether that's, you know, whether that's a sensible use of resources, human capital or otherwise? I think the answer to your question of whether whether that will then end up in a situation where humanity and capitalist system is serving humanity or whatever is the end cause that it, it should be serving, I think you have your answer when you're looking around and seeing what those resources are getting done. But I, I, I fully agree. This is the, I, I think we are using it consciously also to to raise that alter, like the other other perspective. And sometimes you need to Put yourself out there a little bit to make sure that the other perspective is being seen and heard. And I believe this this will be a, a big topic in the future. And actually, a lot of uh, even though this might seem mind boggling to many people from more the traditional ESG or traditional economics, what I find really exciting and and sometimes makes me smile a lot is that many of the younger for example, students who are using our, our data model. So we give it fully out uh, for free. I love to see whenever students are building something on top of it just on their own for free, that they see that this is, of course, something that should be considered. Like, of course, it is the human capital is not infinite. Of course, we should be mindful of what we use it for. So I'm also looking forward for this new generation to, to have their say. So I searched on Upright for Upright. So, so I was checking whether you have scored your own company. And of course you have. And, and when I did so, I saw, I read the following. So it says, Upright is a Finnish technology startup providing net impact data for investors and companies. Upright builds an ML-enabled net impact quantification model measuring impact of companies to the environment, health, society, and knowledge creation. And then you see a number of very interesting scores. So just to pick some out, I see that uh, Upright has a net impact ratio of 15%. The largest cost with minus 24 is the use of scarce human resources that we just discussed. And the largest benefit uh, with plus 18 is knowledge creation. Just can you give us a sense of what do these figures mean? And do you think they properly reflect what Upright is doing? Yes, absolutely. Otherwise, I wouldn't be <laughs> probably building building something like this. So maybe just a quick quick sort of rundown of, of, of the numbers you mentioned. Of course, the first one has to do with the aggregate score. So you mentioned the net impact ratio. Again, a highly debated thing. I've been going back and forth during these past seven years of what kind of an aggregate score should we be serving in order to not give people an easy way out to just think this is a binary evaluation of, of companies. So just to be clear, our customers typically use the 31 indicators under this 
aggregate score. They you when they build their funds, they're not looking at aggregate score. They're looking at hey, we want to maximize or to minimize CO2 emissions and biodiversity losses while creating these and these health impacts in these and these industries and maximizing taxes and jobs in region X or something like that. But anyways, for the aggregate score, I believe it is intellectual honesty to provide one and it will always be imperfect. I have never loved any one of the aggregate scores we have tried out. The net impact ratio has now been around for about three years. It is something that our customers like because it is, and we tried, so what is the net impact ratio? It is the positive monetized impact of in each of the, whether the impact categories and an aggregate level on the company minus the negative impacts divided by the positive impacts. So it's similar to net profit ratio. And we try to find like an sort of a common ground, a way, way to understand how impact could be looked at similarly as financial profit. How we derive at that is basically the idea that we take, as I briefly mentioned before, we take 100% of each of the impact categories, we estimate their scale, and we then allocate it across the whole private sector. Then you would end up with teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny percentages that would be very hard to say, like 0.00000 uh, something percentage of the global, let's say, preventing and treating physical diseases impact would go to medication X. Uh, instead of using that, we then use this monetized impact in cents per dollar of revenue. So we take it in the context of the size of the company to understand the sort of intensity of that impact. And that's how you end up with the minus 24 and the plus 18. And your question of how they depict upright, I think that's a perfect ex- description. What what I do, I bear great responsibility of using the brains of 46 amazingly talented, highly educated people who could have a large impact elsewhere, who could be also building something else. And I feel that it is my duty to get at least that much then value out of these people and out of our work together. And the the shape that a product like ours would take would then be in the format of knowledge, as it is a essentially a data service. So we are no snowflake in this regard. Uh, we take our own medicine and measure our own net impact and aim to constantly improve it. And of course, then the trick is for us to get more impact out of the same number of people, out of the same number of resources, emissions, whatever are are included in, in uh, running our offices and so on. Very good. Yeah, you get your own, you, you take a, a sip of your own medicine. That's That's exactly right. And I think that's very good. Now, in the aggregation, there's the obvious problem of, you know, adding different units. I, I think you have an appreciation for units, right? There, There's tons of carbon and there's the number of jobs created and it's far from obvious how you would aggregate these units. One approach is monetization that you give each one a dollar value. And then of course it's all in, in dollars or whichever currency you prefer. So how, how do you deal with the fact that some people might think carbon emissions are more important than than jobs and and otherwise so 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 how how is that approached i think it's very important to have a sort of dual approach or there are two steps of the process one of them is to say that no this is actually not a matter of opinion you can't say that hey we actually like you know gender diversity because that's what we sort of happen to be good at like we have i don't know two women in boards the other oil companies have zero or something like that And then choose that this is now an important value for us. I think this is an immense intellectual bug in thinking that has been taken over the sort of crazy number of corporate executive boardrooms that you think this is something that you can order from a communications agency to then like, what's most important for us? That is not the question. Science does not ask what is the what is most important to the five random people that happen to be in the room when this brainstorming took place. There are some scientific facts about certain impacts and their scale and scope, looking at biodiversity, carbon emissions, but also many societal impacts, like having to do with equality. And whether it's a certain type of equality happens to be close to you or not, it doesn't make it any less real what the actual impact is. So the first layer is applying the best available. And let me be honest, it is not great, but it is the the only way to get forward is to start using those numbers to make it transparent how little humanity knows of even, let's say, the, for example, the actual scale of biodiversity loss. Two mm-hmm. years ago, we had a completely different view. Five years ago, we had a completely different, different view. Ten years ago, we didn't even know it existed. And I think five years from now, we will know a lot more than we know today. So the upright model aims to take the best available scientific knowledge of the scales of the impacts and say that, hey, this is not a matter of opinion. That's the first step. 
you will have an impact in category X, whether you care for it or not. It is up to your stakeholders to decide what is important. You may communicate about X or Y, but your stakeholders might still care for something completely different. And that impact is equally real. But then the second layer is to let the stakeholder themselves, whether it's the investment fund that is making an investment thesis, that's what we do on a practical level every day with these great institutions we work with. They basically translate their investment thesis into a layer they then apply on top of these, what we call economic costs and gains or costs and benefits that we estimate in the model. So they might say that for our group of customers, for our LPs, we are putting now a high-end value on job creation here and biodiversity loss there and this and this and the health arena we are now letting completely. We're not looking into it right now. And then they put these layers that we then call these sets of values or the optimization criteria on top of it. And this is just a matter of very simple arithmetics. It is relatively simple compared to everything that happens before. But it is important to say that even if you can then choose to emphasize biodiversity more, it might be that your LP is still going to ask you about waste or ask you about social injustice. And you need to have answers for these questions. And that's why we are in a way forcing all of the, or enabling all of the investment funds and corporations to understand the whole value creation spectrum that they that they will at some point run into in their processes. Thank you. Something that I did when I looked at your example is, is looking at the, the most negative and the most positive impact. And I think it's a really useful lens to look at companies, you know, rather than just the aggregate, because my conviction is that it's not that there are good and bad companies. It's more that every company can do something useful and every company has a few levers they can pull to do something much better. And I think in the ESG debate, that strategic thinking about, you know, what can I do today is lost a bit versus, you know, the increasing number of, of standards or, or, or frankly, also stakeholder demands or media-based pressure that you just, you know, perform on the canonical uh, criteria being, of course, carbon emissions and, 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 uh, and gender equality and, you know, whatever is the is currently the, the most talked about issue. What's your sense on that? Is is upright a good tool to get an internal external view of you know what what is going well here, what is what isn't, or is it used that way? That was one of my biggest questions in the beginning. Well, first of all, like, does anyone want to look at this data, let alone pay for it? Uh, when we're telling some of these, on the one hand, very obvious truths and something very obvious what the science is saying, and on the other hand, something not necessarily what companies would themselves like to highlight. In this sense, I've been quite a humble learning from the portfolio managers and the corporate executives that are using our data. And I've, I've realized that there is a surprisingly high readiness for, for something like this, for, for using it as a tool to identify what can we do better. And I think many corporate ex- executives, I've never met a corporate executive that didn't want to rather do something good than something bad. It's, yeah. This is just such a big mess that it's sometimes very hard to navigate through it. And I think many find our data to be somehow just healthy, refreshing to, to look at this kind of like non-complicated or I don't know if I can say no, at, at least the, the sort of end outcome aims to be, aims to be fairly, fairly simple. They use it a lot to basically highlight, okay, so these are our three largest negative impacts. And we also, of course, look at it through the ESRS, the, the CSRD spec of double materiality that can also be used and look at the financial risk. These are the top five things. How about we now focus on th- these instead of the 217 projects we have ongoing? And we actually try to make a difference in these five categories instead of reporting on these 200 things. And I think this is one of the biggest impact that I feel good about that my company is able to, to offer is that it basically helps executives to gain a sense of focus. And also for the, for the largest positive impacts, how can we double this? How can we triple this? Uh, what should we be doing in order to really grow this positive impact? Because in the end of the day, the environment doesn't need any companies. The environment doesn't need any of this thing we are doing, but we're doing it for some societal health or knowledge related impacts that are helping humanity somehow. So how can we how can we get the best use out of the resources that we are we're using? So my answer is yes. And I, I didn't know this when I got started. And this is something that is inspiring me today. Also to think it further, like how can this really be used to to guide strategic decision-making. 
Now, there is a big push in Europe for, for more disclosure of sustainability data, and your startup is sort of right in between that. Could applications such as Operate replace disclosure mandates or, or make it easier for companies to comply? And maybe also more generally, how do you see the interplay of disclosure regulation and Upright's work? I think considering what we've just discussed about the what it takes to actually quantify the value chain impacts, I think it's close to impossible for companies to start quantifying the value chain impacts, let alone do they have the incentive to do it objectively. If I wanted to know the what's the number of disability adjusted life years that are being lost because of tobacco related products, I wouldn't go to Philip Morris. I would go to the World Health Organization. So I think I think it is uh, what, what the global sustainability scene is, is facing is we need to improve our understanding of what is company's role in creating better knowledge about all of this. And I, my, my view is very clear. Company's role is, is to offer as good transparency as they possibly can on their core business. What are they producing? How? For whom? And so on. And not quantify their own impact. I don't think that makes sense resource-wise, and I don't think it makes sense incentive-wise. And I think um, similarly to companies don't write their own credit ratings uh, for financial matters. Or so. So I, I think I think this is a scene that we'll we'll soon learn more about. Another lens of looking at is simply saying there are certain traditional ESG metrics that make sense for companies to have. These are like the, your hygiene level principal adverse impact indicators and so on that can then be utilized to actually measure the impact. But for the impact side, I would have a very hard time understanding how companies themselves could offer something meaningful to put these things in perspective that we've been discussing today. And I also think the cost of human resources that we touched upon earlier is is relevant. So just the number of hours that that go into compliance with the reporting is in my sense you know pretty substantial and although of course external rating agencies have certainly problems of their own right there's it's not that they're free of incentive problems but i think they have one thing going for them and that is efficiency it's just pretty efficient to, uh, you know, develop a system to do this at scale and very quickly. So, in some sense, you know, from a policymaking perspective, you'd have to think of the opportunity cost of people sitting there complying with regulation, and what will be, you know, what will be the outcome of that. So, do you think there is a way for? your company upright and perhaps others to just drive down the the burden of complying with that regulation do you see a role for that or is it more sort of just a completely alternative approach no it's it, it it's completely as you said well very concrete example the double material assessment uh, everybody who has had the pleasure of of getting more familiar with the csrd regulations knows that this is quite an exercise and purely from a from a productivity point of view i mean we've been building a machine that is basically quantifying these hundreds of of different lines of impact through various industries for the past 7 years so this simply just makes sense for them to utilize something like this so definitely it's a productivity thing and i'm sometimes almost a little bit worried for the competitiveness of the eu area if we turn this reporting hassle into sort of even even a, even a bigger circus. So there are more efficient ways to do it. And that's the, just the more more mundane uh, discussion of utilizing tech. And even that, that, I mean, that's the business where I'm in. That's where that's where a lot of our, our revenue comes in as well. So I'm going to be sort of fully, fully, fully transparent about that. Uh, but I do want to uh, sort of sort of touch upon and emphasize the point that even if even if the productivity gains did not, did not exist, we need to understand how these things are very different from financial reporting. So let's say that there wasn't a consensus on what is profit. Let's say there wasn't a consensus on what is even revenue. Let's say there wasn't a consensus of what are costs. And I might say that, hey, for our, our company, the unique snowflake of Upright, we don't consider our office rent to be cost. Also, our salaries are not really cost. If everybody could define their financials the way we are defining <laughs> sustainability and impact company by company, fund by fund, we would find the mess that is today's discussion on corporate sustainability. That's why I believe it is both a productivity question, but also a question of any kind of common sense comparability existing. And I'm not rooting for ESG rating providers that has a horrible rep. I really don't want to be associated as, as one myself. 
But I do believe that more modern approaches to measuring impact and daring to look beyond just the backyard of one company are needed in order to make any sense of this discussion. Yes. Thank you. Speaking of the reputation of ESG rating providers and also credit ratings, we've we've talked about them. So I'm very happy for Uprate to be out there doing something new, something innovative. So it fits very well with the topic of the podcast. And I think it's it's very much needed in, in this day and age, which is, as you say, more and more compliance driven. Is Uprate going to stay independent? Or, or you know, what's the exit plan? Or, or will you be part of S&P at some day? And then, you know, then we have the same incentive problems all over. I don't think anyone in their right mind would start a company like mine to think of a fast and easy exit. So this is for me, not just a, a startup I'm running to see what works. This is, this is my life's work. This is, um, I mean, in good and bad, I'm completely obsessed with this topic. When it comes to independence, I, I take that very, very seriously. So when we got started, as you know, there are many ways to work with venture capital to get, get funding fast, uh, ramp up certain operations. I felt it was immensely important to stay independent. Like the cap, the cap table of Upright matters a lot. So we are more than 80% owned by the doers, me and my co-founder, the team. The team is every, every relevant player is also owning a part of the operation. And in addition to that, we have what we call our the third family member of our family-owned company, Risto Silasma, who is the ex-chairman of Nokia and an entrepreneur himself and has been backing many of the great success stories out of Finland and, and, and Europe. And then we have one German climate tech fund, Planet A. I was extremely lucky to find them. Cannot thank anything else than my luck because I really didn't understand the VC scene well enough at that point, who came on board two years ago. In terms of our sort of independence and the, the sort of path forward, my nightmare would be to, to sort of uh, <laughs> sell, sell to a bank and become their greenwashing arm. And that's, that's something that we don't see in our future, but rather building towards a situation where we can, we have the freedom to, to first of all, leave our open access ethos to the max, are able to make this information available for the random student in Belgium or the single mom in Congo or the researcher in based in Toronto who is wanting to make a difference. So this is really, really something. I, I don't see this, this uh, scene moving forward without enough open access data, lar- large enough group of people being able to criticize, ask questions, look at not just our numbers, but the numbers that we link then to the company themselves. For the exit plan, let's see what happens. Maybe there will be some sort of an IPO. Maybe there will be some other moves happening. But this is definitely something that is of utmost importance for us. And we are not afraid to also sometimes even leave money on the table if if that is required in order for us to remain our independence and just to be able to build this thing. Because life is too short. This is being able to, being privileged enough to be able to build something like this with the team that I have is is for me immensely valuable. And that's what's driving me forward. Thank you, Anu. Thank you for this great answer. And for all our listeners, that was a question that was actually not on the pre-agreed sheet. Uh, so <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you very much for that. I, I do think it is very important and I hope you'll keep up that independent mindset. It's, it's, really, it's really mind-boggling what, what you're doing. And, and I really wish you all the best with it. I usually so finish much. the yeah. I usually finish the podcast on uh, you know asking the guests to open up a little bit about the future. So, what is something that you would like to see in five to ten years from now? Mm. I think to maybe sum up our discussion from today, I would love it that in five to ten years from now, if a person, whether it's a student, an investor, a corporate executive a regulator, anyone really, a human being on this planet would like to understand what's really the impact of Tesla. And they would go on their browser and type Tesla impact. They would not land in the company's own sustainability report or other marketing material by the company, but they would land on a neutral, common sense summary of what science knows about this company. I would love to have a go of, of offering that in the format of the upright platform, but regardless of whether it's me or someone else who builds that, I would love to have this sort of 
backbone of knowledge of how companies actually impact the world around us be the first voice of sanity before then linking towards the different views by the company itself, analysts, raiders, whatever. But the first land on on something, something that utilizes what humanity has accumulated in the past couple of hundred years and ties that together and starts the conversation off from that. Beautiful. Beautiful project, something I can sign up to as a as a scientist myself. Let's work together making that a reality. Sounds great. Yes. With that, I would like to thank you very much for being available for the podcast. This was a really insightful conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much, Julian. It was a great conversation. And I'll uh, include links to the Upright project and, and other relevant material in the show notes so you can check it out further. It's really worth it. As Anu said, there's a free version that already gets you quite a lot of information. If you're a student and you've listened, it seems there's abilities to opportunities to get even more. So get in touch and have a great day. Bye, everyone. Innovations in Sustainable Finance, a University of St. Gallen podcast by Julian Kölbel.